Our Old Testament reading comes from 2 Kings chapter 20. Around that same time, Hezekiah became deathly ill. The prophet Isaiah, Amoz's son, came to him and said, This is what the Lord says, put your affairs in order because you are about to die. You won't survive this. Hezekiah turned his face to the wall and prayed to the Lord, Please, Lord, remember how I have walked before you in truth and sincerity. I have done what is right in your eyes. Then Hezekiah cried and cried. Isaiah hadn't even left the middle courtyard of the palace when the Lord's word came to him. Turn around, say to Hezekiah, my people's leader, this is what the Lord, the God of your ancestor David says. I have heard your prayer and I've seen your tears. So now I'm going to heal you. Three days from now, you'll be able to go up to the Lord's temple. I will add 15 years to your life. I will rescue you and this city from the power of the Assyrian king. I will defend this city for my sake and for the sake of my servant David. Then Isaiah said, prepare a bandage made of figs. They did so and put it on the swelling, at which point Hezekiah started getting better. May God speak to us through these words of scripture. Imagine hearing the physician tell you, you only have days to live. Some of you may have actually had a physician give you some bad news. You may have heard her say, it's malignant, or you have heart disease. And you may have interpreted that to mean it's terminal, but it may not have been. How quickly our fear of death takes over. King Hezekiah became very ill with an acute infection. The prophet Isaiah told him to put his affairs in order. There's no time to sign up for hospice, Hezekiah. Your life is over. Get your will and make sure it's up to date. That's bad. It's like the guy who was told by the physician that he was terminal. So he asked, Doc, how long do I have? The doctor replied, 10. The man said, 10? 10 what? 10 weeks, 10 months? The doctor replied, nine, eight. I need to give a little historical background to Hezekiah's illness. 200 years prior to this, Solomon's kingdom had been divided into two nations, Israel in the north and Judah in the south. Israel's 10 tribes were much larger and stronger than Judah's two tribes. However, the Assyrian army had destroyed Samaria, the capital city of the northern kingdom of Israel, in 721 BC after a three-year siege. The Assyrians carried off the 10 tribes of Israel into exile as slaves. After defeating all the surrounding nations, the king of Assyria, Sennacherib, set his sights on Judah. Sennacherib had conquered all of Judah except for the capital city of Jerusalem, but he had it surrounded. He bragged that he had destroyed the 46 towns and cities of Judah and that he had trapped Hezekiah in Jerusalem like a bird in a cage. The year was 701 BC. Then the Bible relates a miraculous account of God striking dead 185,000 Assyrian troops camped around Jerusalem. Sennacherib returned home to Nineveh without conquering Jerusalem. However, Hezekiah had to send an enormous and humiliating amount of tribute each year to the Assyrian king. It's not surprising that Hezekiah fell ill. That's what stress does to us. I cannot imagine what it would be like to see all the cities and towns in your kingdom cry out to you for help, but each one falls one by one. You could not protect them against the much larger Assyrian army. Then you are captive in your own city while the enemy taunts you and demoralizes the people. In the end, even though you and Jerusalem are spared, you have to send an enormous tribute each year to the king of Assyria which impoverishes you and your people. Stress can make you ill. The pandemic is taking its toll on people physically and psychologically. Mental health is a struggle, not only for those grieving the loss of loved ones, 
but also for medical workers, those unemployed, business owners, and many more. When our minds are stressed, it often shows up in physical symptoms. So Hezekiah's body reacted to the pressure he had been under. His greatest fear was to die from this illness. We can all relate to that. The prophet Isaiah predicted the king would die from it. But Hezekiah prayed and prayed and prayed to survive. God listened. He told Isaiah to do an about face and to let the king know that God had granted Hezekiah 15 more years. Speaking of praying for people to be healed from illness, I read the letter written by a certain country preacher, Parson Jones, to his flock. Dear flock, last Sunday, we had a lot of folks absent from the church because of sickness and other reasons. But we prayed for the sick ones at home, and I want to share with you what I saw when I rode around town Sunday afternoon. I saw Frank Smith, who had been deathly sick that very morning, had roused up and was riding down the highway with his fishing poles, a miracle. Then there was Roberta's brother-in-law. She had requested prayer for him that morning because he might have to have an operation on his back. Well, prayer works because at two o'clock I saw him at the driving range hitting golf balls. But what made me really happy was to see so many shut-ins out riding and enjoying the world. Franz Paul, who can't stand crowds and don't attend church for that reason, was headed to a bluegrass concert. Tony's mom, who was too weak to get out of the house, was uptown window shopping. Omega's older sister, who can't come to church on account of her kidneys, stood in line two hours to get into the picture show. Yep, it really thrilled my heart to see what I saw. I ought to have a packed house next Sunday with all my folks being healed and shut in, set free. I just hope they don't overdo themselves next Sunday and have a relapse. Yours for more miracles, Parson Jones. Yesterday, we celebrated Independence Day. Although independence from England was declared on July 4th, 1776, this nation was not, in fact, independent at that time. It would take a great deal of sacrifice on the part of many for the United States to become an independent nation. One of the keys was the leadership of General George Washington, especially during the winter of 1777 and 78. It was a brutal winter at Valley Forge. The Continental Army lost about 2,000 of its 12,000 men to disease related to, no doubt, to malnutrition and the bitter cold. They had few supplies. I wondered what those people feared. If they got sick with typhoid, dysentery, influenza, or smallpox, no doubt they prayed and prayed to God to live. And some of them survived their illness, just like Hezekiah. Then they faced the real possibility of dying in battle. None of us wants to face death. I like what Woody Allen said, I'm not afraid to die. I just don't want to be there when it happens. We fear many things. The fear of dying, the fear of contracting a debilitating disease, the fear of losing our mental faculties, the fear of becoming a burden on others, the fear of being bedridden, and other fears plague us. We don't want to suffer, and we don't want to die. We don't want our loved ones to suffer and die. Yes, I sometimes know people do want to die. One of the first pastoral calls I made was to a woman in a nursing home in Greensburg, Indiana. She was 96 years old. She begged me to pray for her to die. She was so tired. I was a young pastor in my 20s. I could not imagine praying for someone to die. I just could not do it. So I prayed for, for her for grace and strength. I don't think she was happy with me. Praying for people to die was something I had to learn. Since then, I've prayed for many people to die. Some have even requested it. However, most of us don't want to die. We want to hang on to life. Jesus taught a principle. Those who hold on to their lives will lose them, but those who give up their lives for God's sake will find them. Peace only comes when we let go. Our tendency is to hang on tight. But the counterintuitive truth that Jesus knew and that others have learned is that it is only when we let go that we can find peace about death. 
It is only when we face the fact that we will die and begin to accept the loss that we can be freer to live and to trust in God. The wisdom traditions of many religions teach us to face the fact that we are finite. In his course, Practicing Mindfulness, Dr. Mark Moose has a lecture, Finitude, Finitude, Living in the Face of Death. At the end of the lecture, he leads a guided meditation on death awareness. As you go through the meditation, you imagine family and friends, you picture each one of them, and you feel your love for them. Then you see them disappear. In the mindfulness practice, you observe your thoughts and feelings as they are gone. Then you go through the same exercise for all your possessions, all the people and places you have known. Eventually, you imagine everything vanishing. You are completely alone. You observe how you feel and think. Finally, you imagine that you are gone and only emptiness remains. It sounds like a depressing and morbid exercise. I was surprised that it brings a sense of peace and gratitude for life and the ones we love. It helped me understand the diff in a different way the truth that Jesus taught all of us who hang on to life end up losing it. But giving up one's life to God brings meaning and peace. The more we can face up to death, the more we can see life as a gift and are grateful. I know our lives will end up, will end at some point, certainly, we all know that. But for each moment we have, we are thankful. Many years ago, the ship known as the Empress of Ireland went down with 130 Salvation Army officers on board along with many other passengers. Only 21 of those Christian workers' lives were spared, an unusually small number. Of the 109 workers drowned, not one body had on a life preserver. Many of the survivors told how those brave Christians, seeing that there were not enough life jackets, took off their own and strapped them onto others, saying that because of their faith in God, they were prepared to die. Their supreme sacrifice and faithful words set a beautiful example. I know a man who battled cancer for years. He told me and others that his Ill illness was the best thing that had ever happened to him. I was shocked. He had lost so much weight when he told me that. He was a shadow of the former Marine. His disease had turned him into a walking corpse. But he explained that facing death made him realize how important his family and friends were. It made him value his time with them and the times that he was able to come to church and worship. He appreciated each moment he had been given. Before his disease, he took all that for granted. Hezekiah celebrated after he learned that he was going to live 15 more years. As his infection cleared, he gave thanks to God. People I have known whose lives have been threatened by disease but who have survived are always very grateful. No doubt Hezekiah was thankful for each extra day he was given. Hezekiah went to the temple to praise God. One of the songs he probably sang was, The Lord is my shepherd, what we call the 23rd Psalm. Let me read it in a different version. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his namesake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. When we put our lives in the hands of our loving shepherd, we can live with peace and love in our hearts. We don't face death alone. Our loving shepherd takes care of us and watches over us. Our friends and family support us. And when that time comes for us to die, the Lord will lift us to his shoulders and carry us home. And whatever we have to face in the meantime, the Lord will gently guide us to still waters and green pastures. 
He will be with us as we walk through the valley of the shadow of death to restore our souls and grant us peace. Thanks be to God.